Thanks very much indeed, uh, Mike. Um, I must say, given how busy the news agenda is in food retailing right now, um, I'm delighted to be up here on stage with you, P particularly uh, as you have your, I believe you've got some trading numbers out on Wednesday. Yes, I'd have to shoot you if I told you. But well, I do well that's right. We, we won't even try that. But, um, but, but how many CEOs volunteer to sit down with the media two days before they uh, put some numbers out? I, I take my hat it's off to you. a bit of you, light relief. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, and the numbers, of course, uh, as many know, will illustrate once again just how, how fierce this, this price war is that's raging uh, in food retailing between the supermarkets uh, and the discounters. Um, yes, we won't delve into what those numbers might look like, but hopefully we'll get, as we, as we address the sustainability issue, hopefully we'll get a little bit of an insight into uh, consumer confidence um, stats and, and, and something on... Um, food price inflation, because you've, been, you've, you've said quite a few things about that. Uh, but of course, tonight, as we've heard from Jim and indeed from Mike, it's about sustainability strategy, the extent to which things have changed since the Going Naked uh, event in 2012. It was a brave move, as Jim said, by the company to do it then. It's another admirable move to come uh, and discuss with us the area that had the biggest gap uh, in the analysis, namely engaging um, with customers or engaging customers in sustainability, I should say. And it's there, Mike, that I want to start. More price cuts today from Morrison's. Some pretty hefty price cuts announced today uh, from Morrison's. That price war is clearly raging. You've promised to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, on prices. Given all of that, how hard is it to focus on sustainability, let alone engage customers in sustainability? Well, as I've already talked a little bit about, I mean, in the end, it has to be the heart of our business model because we don't think the two are mutually exclusive. So uh, if you take energy reduction as a classic example, in the end, there is an economic benefit to us as an organisation as well as an environmental and, you could argue, social benefit as well. So, as I say, the two aren't mutually exclusive and our challenge is to make sure it's woven into the day-to-day -day business model that we operate and the organisation understands, appreciates and engages with that. I mean, another example would be, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about our dairy development groups. Um, as a result of sharing data between individual farmers within those dairy development groups, we've dramatically improved their sustainability agenda. They're, they have much less environmental impact than they would have done um, previously and they have derived a financial benefit from it as well. So those farmers, as a result of being in that group, not only get a fair price, but they also get the benefit of a broader sustainability agenda, and they see the economic and environmental impact as a result of that. Um, forgive me, I'm going to push this a little, a little bit harder. Um, when we look at the whole, the whole picture, I, I wonder the extent to which people get this. I'm just going to read um, one of the analyst comments on the back of your... Uh, I think it was the May 6 numbers. The strong values of Mike Coop's company should be applauded, but what really matters in today's market is strong value, and is he delivering that right now? It would appear not. Can you build a sustainable business in this sector at this time and at the same time boost the share price? I, I believe I can and we will, so um, absolutely. I mean, again, um, we wouldn't be doing it unless we believe that the things fit together. I mean, in the end, at the heart of our business model is the idea um, that we are a values-based business and that our customers trust us and that we have to be able to demonstrate that week in, week out. The reality is that I think every year for the last six years, we've, out we've outperformed our competitive set. We did last year. It was against a very challenging industry backdrop. So um, I'm sure you can pick from a range of analyst views. You probably have some at the other end of the spectrum. Sure, you would absolutely yeah. see um, the values-based approach as being a form of customer differentiation and one of the reasons why we've tended to outperform our, our peers. So I don't believe it's mutually exclusive, and I believe that there's value to be derived uh, from a shareholder perspective as well as from a customer. Has, has anything, in, uh, on the sustainability front and what you're trying to achieve, has, has, has this been compromised at all in light of the current context and the price wars, et cetera, et cetera? Or, or, or does it just strengthen your resolve? No, it strengthens our resolve. But I'd also suggest, I mean, going back to the research, what it would lead you to is perhaps being sh more sharply focused on some specific issues. Mm -hmm. you know, to the point about... 
um, translating a values-based agenda into something that works for customers, you would come back to the three things that I've highlighted as being the things that you would disproportionately invest mm. effort into. It works for the business, but it also works from a customer communication point of view. And to the point about shareholder delivery, if it influences customers in their choice of shop week in, week out, that clearly has a, a shareholder benefit as well, which is why you kind of get yourself into the territory of focusing perhaps on a fewer things from a customer communication point of view, yeah. whilst not losing sight of the fact that there are other things that you should be doing as a good business. Uh, in fact, the customer communication, I mean, that, that's something I'd like to, to pick up on. Um, and I think it was something Andrew Hill asked Justin on this stage back in 2012. Um, and I, it was along the lines of, are you telling a convincing enough story to your customers? You know, is it, is it down to communication of a compelling strategy or is it the strategy itself that isn't as good as m and for example? Well, I think you have, you have to do both. I mean, again, underpinning our business model is the idea that, that we build in our sustainability agenda and that has a material business benefit. It's not a cost to the business, it's actually a benefit mm. to the business. Mm. You have to believe that, but equally, I'm sure has been, has been highlighted and you've highlighted again, there are some uh, challenges around communicating that to customers and that's one of the reasons why I suspect if you look forward, we'll be talking more overtly about certain subject areas and perhaps less about others because in the end there's a limit to how much you can talk to customers about. There's a very noisy um, playing field out there but it doesn't mean that we stop the other stuff and that's the important thing but you need to turn up the things which have most relevance to customers and as I've said already the number one on the list is, is waste, particularly food waste, but also packaging waste. How, how closely do you watch what, what your competitors are doing on the sustainability front? I mean, because we talk about face, I think it, about waste, I think it was this week I read Tesco giving to British charities, their food waste to, to, to charities or leftover food to charities. How closely do you watch that and how closely do you try and either emanate or beat? I watch it very closely, yeah. um, as the guys over here will tell you. Um, and, uh, you know, if other, inevitably it's a very competitive market. Actually, the competitive advantage you can get from anything is relatively short-lived because, broadly speaking, it's a very transparent market. Uh, so you can see very, uh, in real time, what's going on in our business. You can go into our shops, you can see it. Um, and anything that um, looks like a source of competitive advantage, others will try and emulate and copy. So you should, we should take... Um, imitations are sincere as yeah, form of no, flattery. Absolutely. But, um, is it, but is it about, sorry to interrupt, but is, is it about, okay, so they do that. Look, we, we can't let them get away with looking as though they're out on the forefront here. We need to jump one step ahead of them to the point where you're being actually very, very bold. Um, and, then it, and then it brings into question how, how bold you can be with customers before you start alienating them. Yeah, I mean, I'm a very firm advocate of making sure that you do the do. Uh, anybody can talk the talk, and there have been many examples where we've seen people do that. But we have to be able to demonstrate, well, first of all, we have to be sure of our ground. We have to be able to um, talk uh, from a position of authority in terms of understanding the underlying issue. And there are many issues which get miscommunicated, and we've seen the results of that uh, in many territories. But then we have to be able to translate that into the day-to-day -day machinations of a very large and sometimes quite complex business. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be an advocate of putting stuff out there for the sake of putting it out there because I just think that makes you a hostage to fortune. And in the end, if you have a brand that's built on trust, you have to be able to demonstrate, you have to be held to account for mm. delivering against the promises that you make. And whether you look at businesses or indeed at the political arena, you can see the way that customers, the population more generally get disengaged from businesses that aren't able to deliver on the promises uh, that they make. No, absolutely. And, and then, of course, there's that other part, which is, um, well, you, you tell me, but business is getting a little bit too preachy at, 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 at when, when, when people are time-pressed or, or at a very sensitive time in, in, in this sector. Um, how much of a danger is that? Oh, there's, there's definitely, you know, the language you use and the tonality of what you say um, and the importance of, of to your, using your words, not preaching, mm. uh, it is important. I mean, it is important that we get the tonality right. But interestingly, again, the tonality 
depends on customers. So thinking quite carefully about, as we look forward, how we might engage different groups of customers in different topic areas or perhaps talk to them in slightly different ways. Mm. Because the way that we might engage with my mother, just to use the example, versus engaging with my daughter are dramatically different. Yeah. You know, my mother can barely use a mobile phone. My daughter is never off hers. Um, and you know, that world is very different. So we have to think quite carefully about how we engage with, a, with our customer mm -hmm. base in a personalized way, but on a broad, a broad spectrum. And, and I'd like to get a little bit of insight, if we could, into, into how that's going. Um, on the back of your survey, um, which you referenced as well. Um, the, 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 uh, Judith Batchelor, director of brand, says, how can we understand customer values better than anyone else? Um, I'm, I'm interested in that and how you think you can and, whether you, and to what extent you see that as an area of competitive advantage. Well, we definitely see it as an area of competitive advantage. And as a brand that's existed for not far off 150 years, we think it's one of the things which runs through our DNA. And our customers expect us to do. They expect, um, they trust us to do, the, to do the right thing. In fact, Judith is just over there, so I might <laughs> ask her to answer the question in a minute um, on the back of this. But um, uh, in, in the end, um, our knowledge, and you know, take supply chains as an example, I think we know our supply chains better than our competitors mm. because we invest a lot of time into it. We've engaged our pharma groups and we believe that the linkage between what we do, what they do, and the bits in between are better than any of our, any of our competitors. In the environmental mm. agenda, you know, the amount of effort that our teams have gone into looking at how they can reduce energy consumption uh, as I said already, a lot of these things can be copied, but you need to be constantly challenging yourself to think about how you can step these things on. So, you know, we've got solar panels on the roof of many of our stores. You know, we've invested in um, you know, anaerobic digestion technology to um, uh, run some of our shops. In fact, one of our shops is off the grid now. It's actually run entirely from um, electricity produced by food, by white food waste. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are plenty of examples in our business where we're pushing the boundaries. We're challenging ourselves constantly, but it always has to be grounded. You know, it always has to be on the basis of something which ultimately will deliver something to our customers or to our business. Um, you, you, you mentioned food waste. Let's 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 uh, pick up on the back of that. Um, how are you um, surprised, shocked, saddened by in any way by, by the way in which those values have 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 changed? You mentioned what was it the uh, seventy percent. In terms of um, uh, food waste, seventy percent saying it's very important uh, for the for the family and for the home. Only two two percent thought of the environment in the whole food food waste debate. Does that number shock you? Uh, not really, because uh, in my experience, and I've kind of outlined it a little bit from a business context as well. You have to find things which are in the sweet spot mm. where customers derive what they see as a benefit to them, and in that particular case, it's a financial benefit which then has an impact um, on the sustainability agenda, either on their world or the world more generally. But it doesn't stop you doing, the important thing is it doesn't stop you doing the right thing. So no. just because fair to employees <clears throat> falls down the list, we should still seek to do the right things as far as our employees are concerned. But it does imply a, a pretty weak demand pull for much of the sustainability program, right? And I just wonder how you, how, how you square that circle. Well, I, I think that's a fair, Point. I mean, in the end, if you ask customers to um, articulate why they shop in a large grocery store like Sainsbury's, they would talk about value and particularly quality and price as the single biggest factors. Uh, and then there is a, a tale of other issues that they'll relate to. Interestingly, for individual customers, there will be specific things which spike, which is one of the reasons why you need to cover a reasonably broad agenda. But if you take it back to the things which are most likely to influence where customers shop, the top three, mm. waste, British sourcing, being fair to farmers, come through time and time again. Doesn't mean you stop doing the other stuff, but those are the things if you want to communicate to customers that mm. Mm. are most likely to have resonance with them. So um, just to back to this point, what we're going to see from Sainsbury's on the back of your research and, the, and, the, and, and understanding or trying to understand customer values, what, what can we, what can, we, what can we expect to see from Sainsbury's that, that might make us sit back and think, wow, these guys really are 
ahead of the game. You have to wait and see. Now I'm not going to preempt. Can you give us a little no, no, bit no. of a clue here? No. Just, no? Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, no. I mean, we're we're working to. I mean, we come to the sort of halfway point of our 20 by 20 yeah. uh, program. Uh, there's quite a few initiatives that we've actually completed. So there are things that we can say we've done and we can move on from. There are some that actually, with the benefit of hindsight, either need to be changed or perhaps won't get finished in the kind of timescales we're talking about. Um, and the piece of work that we're doing currently on the back of the research and on thinking about our business model in the future uh, is um, how we develop our 20 by 20 program for the remainder of this decade. Mm -hmm. So. I suspect we'll talk more fulsomely about some of the but things. But things can be expected well, but, I mean, to change the, pretty quickly. Can yeah, I mean, it's not as if there aren't things constantly going on in our business on a day-to-day -day basis. So, the, you know, the Google Food Rescue app, as an example, is something yep. that um, has only been in the business, what, six months? Mm. So it's a relatively recent uh, innovation, and I'm, so, I'm sure that you'll see other things come through in the fullness of time. I don't want to get too carried away at this point. <laughs> Um, back, back to the, 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 the bigger picture. Um, I've sat on this stage a few times now. We, I've often talked about the importance of, of this coming from the top, and it clearly comes from the top at Sainsbury's. clearly comes from the top at companies like uh, Unilever uh, as well. Is sustainability and well, to what extent is sustainability and CSR a, a common conversation now in your, in your board meetings? Uh, is it a tough sell to John Rogers? John Rogers is our CFO, by the way. So yeah, sorry. He, he's yeah. the master of coin in our business. Um, he's, yeah, the money guy, exactly. The money guy. I, no, I mean, John actually um, sits on the account, in fact, chairs the Accounting for Sustainability Group uh, in the BRC. So he's very much at the heart of the agenda. Uh, and as, as I said already, the, the sort of the sweet spot of, is to find things which are both mm. economically sustainable, mm -hmm. socially sustainable, and environmentally sustainable. And finding those kinds of issues works pretty well from a um, from a CFO's point of view, energy consumption being a very good example of something that not only um, is good for the environment, but also reduces costs within the business. Uh, and to your point about um, engaging in the business more widely, uh, each one of our CSR values, each one of the core values of the business is chaired by one of the operating board directors. Uh, and we report regularly and we have a, a regular um, steering group um, which I chair and they engage in, and it's also, unlike I suspect quite a few PLCs, a separate committee. So we also have one of our NEDs who oversight, oversees what we do, one of our non-exec directors who oversees what we uh, do on a week-to-week, -week, day day-to-day basis. So it absolutely not only sits at the operating board agenda level, but it also sits at the PLC right. board as well, which, which is, I suspect, not universal within the FTSE. But, but, but things must, and I know you don't want to speak for John, but things, things must be getting tougher in his position, um, batting back the, 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 the short-term institutional investors, for example, in the business, who, sees, who, may, not, who may frown a little bit on, on the sort of return, the, how long you, it takes to get a return on, on this sort of investment. Yeah, interestingly, when I, I, mean, I spend a reasonable amount of my time engaged with our shareholders and you get a slightly different picture than you do from perhaps some of the analysts. I mean, the analysts are there to sell shares. Mm -hmm. The investors are the ones that buy the shares and clearly the ones that buy our shares are engaged in the idea that the values base of the business is important from a customer point of view and ultimately will deliver shareholder value. So I don't think there's a disjoint between how our CFO might view it, how our shareholders might view it. There may be a disjoint about how some of the analysts might view it, but then to some extent it's their job to be uh, questioning yeah. uh, there's yeah. a certain yeah. amount of d dissonance. So I, I don't see that there's a disjoint. I'm not sure if you had John Rogers up here. Uh, I think he's actually spoken at one of these events or in the past. So yeah. I, I, sus I suspect if you had him up here, he, he would say the same thing as I do. It doesn't get away from the fact that as a business we have to challenge everything that we do of course uh, and we have to think quite carefully about how we invest our resources uh, and in the end broadly speaking that comes back to money so all the time we have to think about how we prioritize um, but we see it as part of the fundamental business model that we run is, is I guess let me ask the, question, the big question like this is, is sustainability inevitably a cost because there's almost a connotation of of generosity when we speak about sustainability, or at least from a, with my lay person's hat on, that's what it seems like. Um, will it, is it inevitably a cost? Will it always be a cost? Does uh, it have I, to be? I know, I would completely 
diametrically opposite to the way you might have mm. characterised it. So if we take food waste in its broadest sense, it, there's a huge economic cost to food waste. And in our business, we would benefit from reducing our food waste financially, mm. as well as mm. benefit the supply chains that serve us. Equally, at the other end of the spectrum, waste in its general um, sense has a value. I think currently packaging waste is worth 400 pounds a ton. So right. if you can harvest that value, uh, as well as being um, part of thinking about an, a sustainable supply chain, it has, again, an economic potential economic to the business, um, benefit to the business. So um, there are things that we do that have a, a perceived customer benefit. There's no doubt about that. And then you have to think about it in the context of marketing to customers more generally, but there are many, many things that we can do in this space that have an economic business benefit to our business at both ends of the supply chain. And do you think all the chief executives of the food retailers see it like that? I don't know, you'd have to ask them. I, I, yeah. um, I hope not, just in case they notice. So. <laughs> let, I want to ask you um, about the ASA challenge, and, and, and let, me, let me just quickly lay this out for those who don't know, and correct me, Mike, if I'm wrong, but in, in 2013, you complained that a, a Tesco price comparison campaign ignored uh, provenance issues uh, that are important to customers, fair trade versus non-fair non trade, et cetera, sustainably sourced food versus not. Um, the complaint to the ASA was rejected. Uh, the High Court review didn't succeed either. Before I ask you, actually, what, what that meant to Sainsbury's um, and what it meant to you personally, I wouldn't mind just getting a real quick show of hands for those people who read about this, and I'm sure most of you did. Do you, do you agree with Sainsbury's, or do you agree with the ASA and then ultimately the High Court? So if you agree with Sainsbury's, raise your hand, and I'm going to raise mine as well. It's not very impartial of me as a journalist, but... Um, yeah, there's quite a few hands up there. And, and who agrees that the ASA were right? Okay, good. No hands. That was no hands, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what did that mean for Sainsbury's? How big a blow was that for you? Uh, it wasn't a blow, but it was important that we challenged it because we believe the underlying premise of the rules was wrong. Um, Actually, in the particular case you're, you're citing, saying, uh, Tesco was selling fair trade bananas. That's right. But they were comparing non fair oh, oh, trade oh, okay. bananas. It was even worse. Okay. Than you it described. was even worse. Okay. Um, they were comparing non fair trade bananas with fair trade bananas when they could have made a very di direct comparison with their fair trade bananas. And um, we didn't agree on two fronts. The firstly, we didn't agree um, because we thought the values that underpin the product that we sell sold were important. So it was not right to be able to compare. Um, ham sourced from Poland with ham sourced from the UK, as an yep. example, which is one of the things that they were uh, doing. And the second, we objected to the idea that the judge and jury as to what was comparable were, were Tesco themselves, that there had to be some kind of objective measure. We always knew that it was going to be um, challenging because in the end it challenges what they call an equal use definition in European law, mm. and therefore it was unlikely we were going to win but we felt it was important that we pursued it to make a point. And uh, get that message uh, yeah, out. Because the only way it. we could have won is, in effect, it had been referred further up the uh, food chain of the court system uh, and ultimately would have had to require a change in European law because there is this thing called an equal use um, test mm. for when you're making comparisons. Mm. And what about to you personally? So it was worth the massive cost then of pursuing this through the courts? Yeah, I, yep. I believe it was. I believe yep. it made the point. I think it made... Um, particular one competitor and perhaps some of our competitors think quite carefully about it and I think it raised a very serious issue, a specific issue about the validity or otherwise of making um, comparisons across products which in our view were not the same mm. and provenance, sustainability, supply chain management count and we can see that in many real life instances. Mm. And, and what about, if you don't mind my asking to you personally, you know, how important was that for you to keep going with that and show that that's what you stood for? Well, I made the decision first time around and then made the decision to go to the final, what we believed would be the final stage, which is effectively the judicial review, yeah. which we lost. Uh, but I thought it was important that we pursued it. I thought it was important that we uh, made the point and that we pushed it as far as we sensibly could. And the next stage would have effectively been 
um, caught up in the European courts, which we thought you know, ultimately would be a waste of shareholders' money and would some, not be something that we'd pursue. But for, for me personally, it was a big deal because I pushed it very, very hard. Mm, yeah. And I take my hat off to you, I've, I've got to say. Um, just a few more bits and pieces from me before I open it up to, uh, to the audience. Um, the, the chart that Jim showed were, with the gaps, um, and we came, of course, to uh, relationships with customers as, as, as the biggest and getting that message out. How different, what are we, three years on now, how, how different would that chart look now, do you think, if you were to ask this audience? If I was to ask this audience, yeah. I, I have no idea, but I would hope that it had, or certainly if we look at our customer data, then the gap relative to our mainstream competition, and indeed against the benchmark that this audience felt was better than us, mm. has actually increased um, reasonably significant over the, significantly over the last two or three mm. years. So from a customer point of view, and there is a, sometimes a disjoint between what customers think and perhaps what other stakeholder groups think, they would definitely see a big difference from where we were, say, two or three years ago. From, the, from this stakeholder group, I have no idea. Um, I'm no doubt I'll talk about it uh, at the round tables. Um, OK, um, food, food price deflation. I, I need to just for, uh, ask these, because I, I, I'm interested myself to find out what's going on in the context, which, of course, is going to drive a lot of the decision, decision making. I think it was Cantor that said quite recently that things are easing up a little bit, and that must have been music to your ears, because I think you've said before that the, the, the current spiral is, or, or the, 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 what we're in right now with the deflation is, is, is likely to continue into 2016. Do you still yeah. think that? Well, yeah, I mean, there are two, two things that have um, challenged, well, there'd be lots of things that have challenged our market, but two things specifically which I would argue are cyclical effects. One is, broadly speaking, despite around about a 4 or 5% population increase in the last five years, food volumes have been flat. And that has had a significant pressure on our industry. There has been food inflation throughout that period until about October, November of last year. And we saw a very significant reverse of that. And for the first time in my working lifetime, and I've worked in this industry for 30 years, we've seen across <coughs> most of the markets that we operate in uh, a reduction in year-on-year -year pricing. So roughly 2.5%. Um, I don't think that's going to unwind, and I don't think Kantar are yet saying that it's going to unwind until probably the latter part of this calendar year or even into next okay. year. So you still and and, it, and it's, driven by, it's driven by a, a couple of or three factors. The first one is there were record harvests last year, so it was a very, very good harvest for the Northern Hemisphere in particular. Secondly, exchange rates, Euro exchange rates are quite favourable, and the UK imports a reasonable amount of food of its food from Europe. Mm. And thirdly, the Russians closed their borders to yeah. imports from Western Europe. And as a result of that product that was going west, sorry, going east is now going west. And that's created a, an additional surplus of supply. So those three factors created this sort of unique set of conditions that we find ourselves in. And it will take um, about six to nine months to work its way th through the system. Great news for customers, because from a sure. customer point of view, you're about five or a week better <coughs> off on average than you would have been this time last year. Um, not quite so good in terms of pound notes through the till. No. And, and, and I've got to ask you, it would be remiss of me not to ask this with a journalist hat on, Mike. Um, are you going to match Morrison's price cuts? I wouldn't like to comment. Uh, <laughs> we, we say publicly that we match our, our competitors toe to toe. Yeah. There are many prices that move across um, there were some the pretty hefty ones today, though. Yeah, but there are. I mean, yeah. it's ongoing. I think we were talking about the cut and the thrust of the market yeah, that sure. we operate in. Um, virtually every week that I've worked in this industry for 30 years, there's a new price war. Um, you know, there are degrees, and uh, you would expect us to match and make sure that we, uh, or we, we review and um, take the right decisions. Uh, and as we've said publicly, we will match toe-to-toe -to -toe against our competitors. Right.